introduce myself. I'm Prof Di Cooper, and I'm newly I've newly joined the School of Public Health in January. Um, I'm going to be um, dealing with a case study on gender-based violence, and it's um, you will have um, earlier heard uh, an input and had a session with Nikki Shea on social determinants of health, and so really what I'd like to do is to sort of apply that to the case of gender-based violence, and I'd like you to participate as much as possible in terms of your own experience. So first of all, just to start with an overview of what is gender-based violence. Um, it's a broad concept. Um, it doesn't specify the sex of the survivor or the perpetrator. Um, it's a global problem. In other words, it's a problem everywhere, particularly intimate partner violence and um, sexual violence. Um, violence against women is the most common uh, form of gender-based violence. Um, it's estimated that around about one in three women will experience um, some form of either sexual or intimate partner violence in their lifetime. So that's sort of, that's high, you know, that's sort of ec epidemic proportions if you look at one third of, of women. Um, there are a number of... Um, things that can be classified as gender-based violence. Um, harmful practices, for example, include assault, uh, things like diary-related murders that are common in some areas of the world, um, marital rape, um, selective malnourishment of female children uh, where there's male-child preference, uh, forced prostitution, uh, female genital mutilation, although that is obviously a, a somewhat uh, contentious subject, and also sexual abuse. Um, all of those qualify as uh, examples of gender-based violence against women. Um, it also can include verbal abuse, um, emotional uh, coercion, or um, some sort of life-threatening deprivation. Um, for example, if you threaten to withhold something from somebody or to do something um, to them, or if you, for example, humiliate and belittle them, for example, I once had an aunt who, whose husband um, had a shop and she used to work in the shop and he would give her a certain sum of money but it wasn't enough for housekeeping. So she had to steal from the till in order to come out and that sort of economic deprivation can also be seen as a form of, of gender-based violence of abuse. Um, the WHO um, uh, defines uh, physical, sexual, and psychological abuse um, or neglect from intimate partners. Um, and it's, it sees it as the most pervasive form, uh, intimate partner violence, as the most pervasive form of abuse of women. So although sexual violence is also common, the broad category of intimate partner violence is, is in fact the most, um, most a prominent form, which is is sort of really disturbing, not that the other isn't disturbing, because it means that people, that women often have to fear the people who are close to their most in terms of intimate partner violence being the most common. Um, for example, a study of 50, 50 population-based, um, uh, sorry, I'll go back, of uh, 60, 50 uh, population-based studies in 36 countries found that 60% of women who had ever been married or partnered had experienced at least one incident of physical violence, either from a current partner or from a former partner. So once again, that's very high. That's almost two-thirds. Um, half the female victims of homicide, in other words, where a person actually dies, where a woman actually dies, are killed by the intimate partner. So of, of all the women who are killed, um, who are murdered, half of them would have been killed by an intimate partner. Um, also, rape of girls um, and also young women uh, by men is the most common form of rape. Um, also, the rape of boys is becoming more common. So rape of children is, is a major problem. If we look at South Africa, and I know you've got experience from different countries and we'd like to bring that in, violence and injuries is the second largest cause of disability-adjusted um, life years. Disability-adjusted life years shows that 
um, a decrease in life years due to either um, being sick or being disabled or, or due to death. So in other words, you may still be alive but not enjoy a good life. And the second biggest cause of disability-adjusted life years is um, violence and injuries. Now that, of course, includes men as well, um, not just violence against women or gender-based violence. Um, the highest cause of unnatural death uh, is driven mainly by interpersonal violence and gender-based violence. Um, in South Africa, again, to, uh, to give it as an example, um, our rate is twice the global average. A woman killed by intimate partners um, is 150, nearly 158 per 100,000 to the population. And this is um, nearly twice the, the global average of homicide um, by women and of the average and also six times the global average by intimate partners. If we look at some other countries and compare them with each other, what you'll see is um, all rape is, is high in a number of different countries. So you can see that sadly South Africa leads the pack, followed by India, followed by Croatia. If you look at um, sexual intimate partner violence, you can see that India is, has the highest um, uh, prevalence. and. Gang rape is very high in South Africa. This occurs everywhere, but it's particularly high in our context. If you look at those same three countries and look at the distribution on average of how many people have been raped among men who have raped, and this is reported by men, is that by far the most common is one person raped, but you'll see that also men report having raped two to three people, four to five, six to ten. You can see that there's a fairly large amount where it's more than one. Um, in other words, gang rape. The WHO also defines sexual violence as any sexual act uh, to obtain a sexual um, favor or make sexual comments or advances um, against a person, directed against a person, using coercion, and it's um, regardless of the relationship the person might have to the person um, in any setting, and it's not limited to the home or work. So, for example, commonly in South Africa, in urban areas, women report when they go on transport, um, when it's still dark in the morning and go to work, that's, of, that's often a place of vulnerability. Um, also, there is an issue about whether... It's any relationship to the victim. And we could have a very interesting discussion about marital rape, for example. So in many countries in the world, including in South Africa, marital rape is included in the definition of, of rape. Some people believe that that shouldn't be the case, that if a woman has married a, a man, that he should be able to have sex whenever he wants. Um, and that's something that we can discuss. Um, so sexual violence includes... Uh, forcible rape um, or non-physical, uh, forcible rape or non-physical forms of pressure. So in other words, you compel a person, you, you, you rape them after having threatened them that you're going to do something really bad to them. So it's against their will. It's where a woman lacks a choice or she lacks, um, she, and she can't resist the sexual violences, violence advances. And again, in a multi-country study conducted by the WHO, somewhere between 3 and 24% of women reported that their first sexual experience was coerced. So in other words, it was not wanted, it was unwilling. And that's particularly disturbing because that means it's either girls or young women who are often very vulnerable. And most sexual violence, like um, other forms of violence, is perpetrated by somebody known to them. So again, often it's the close people who are close to them who are the most danger, which is, you know, very sad. Um, if we look at violence against women in South Africa as an overview, and it would be great if you brought in examples from, from Zambia, from Uganda, from Tanzania, from Nigeria, from uh, Zimbabwe and so on, different places that you come from. Uh, but if you look at South Africa, um, 
rape perpetration, there was a study done by the South African Medical Research Council that was done amongst men in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal provinces. And men reported 27%, nearly 28% of men reported that they'd ever raped a woman or a girl. And nearly 3% um, reported that they had raped another, this was men, so they'd raped another man or a boy. Um, nearly 5% reported that they'd raped a woman in the last year. And 46% uh, of men said that they had done so more than once. So in other words, it wasn't just one time, not that that is not a problem, but they'd done it more than once. And um, this is of the men who rape, so it's not 73% of all men, but of men who rape, 73% of them, in other words, vast majority, do so by the age of 20. So if we're looking at targeting, targeting interventions, we really need to be targeting towards young men to prevent, um, to change ideas and prevent rape. If we look at domestic violence perpetration, this was in, this, in the same study, 44% uh, of men uh, surveyed said that they'd used physical violence at some stage against a woman or a girl. And 14% reported using violence against a woman or girl in the last year. So it may include hitting them, assaulting them in some way, pinching them, um, throwing them down. So in some way, uh, using physical violence. Um, all women are vulnerable, but there are some who are most vulnerable. So young women, we identified as particularly vulnerable, um, both in terms of physical and sexual violence. Also sex workers, and again, this comes up as an issue because some people say, well, if you're engaging in sex for, uh, for exchange, then that's what you do. But, you know, there's still an issue of whether you're forced to have sex when you don't want to. There's still a choice involved, or should be. Also, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender um, women are particularly vulnerable. And also transgender and often in gay men um, are also. So in South Africa, there have been several incidents of, of um, lesbian women being, being raped because men think that that will somehow, it's, it's, it's an act of violence, but wanting to stop them from pursuing that sexual, sexual orientation. So the issues that I'd like you to think about, and you'll be breaking, we, you won't be breaking up into groups, but you'll be responding, is first of all, do you think violence against women violates their rights? And if so, in what ways? Um, secondly, how does the South African situation uh, compare uh, to the country or local context that you come from? Is there data from your area? So, you know, if you don't collect data, then you don't really know what the situation is. And what are the experiences, even if they're not, isn't data, you all work in situations or live in situations where you may have come across this. So, um, what are the experiences of your context? So I'd like you all to turn to your partners and talk about that, and then we'll move on. So you're having all fed back on that. It's interesting to hear the discussions about, it seems that there is quite a lot of data available, or certainly you have some experience of it. Um, you reported some different ideas about marriage and marital rape. Somebody said, for example, the issue of bride's uh, wealth or um, Lebola sometimes makes men feel that they own the woman and makes families reluctant to intervene. So that was an interesting issue that came up. I'd like to also look at male violence because we could see male violence in some situations as also a form of gender-based violence in that it often uh, stems from, from machism, from men feeling that they need to show the other man uh, that they are a real man in terms of how often men are seen in our society socially. So men are likely to be the perpetrators of violence, the most likely perpetrators. Um, globally, as I mentioned, the perpetrators and the survivors um, where, where there's male-on-male -male violence are disproportionately young men, 15 to 20 nine years. So, you know, again, if we're looking at interventions, that's the key group. 
Um, if we look at specifically specific vulnerabilities like we did for women, um, young men are at particular risk of violence against, uh, of engaging in violence and being the victims of violence. Uh, gay men and also male sex workers. In South Africa, although the most common form of gender-based violence is against women, if you look at homicide rates, men who, people who die, the highest homicide rates are between in that same age group, men aged 15 to 21 years. And it's very high. Again, it's sort of epidemic proportions. We've got a, a real, real problem um, with, with young men dying because of violence. Um, you know, if you look at it outside of a war situation, um, which we are not in. Um, deaths of men from homicide outnumber those of women by more than 7%. So although gender-based violence against women is most common, when it comes to dying, the highest rate of death is ma male on male, from male-on-male -male violence. And um, there are different times of the day. So um, from woman, male to female, it's most commonly in the evening. Two out of three male violent deaths occur at night, often after after drinking, after being at a, a shabin or an a, 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 a informal drinking place, etc. Um, in our region of the world and in South Africa, most of the homicide victims are black, but the highest rate um, reported in men and women who under apartheid were classified as, as colored, which means a particular thing in South Africa, people from mixed descent, um, th that's where the highest rate is. And, you know, we can look at the reasons for that. Some of you come from some of those areas where there's high gang violence, where there's a huge amount of disruption. The Group Areas Act in South Africa removed people from communities which were very functional to new communities. So we can look at some of the social determinants of what, of what comes into play. So again, what I'd like you to consider is how does the South African situation compare um, with the local country context that you come from? Um, is there data from your area that you're living in? What are your experiences in this regard? And what do you think of the dri are the drivers of male violence? Um, how does this affect women and men? So there we're wanting again to start looking at the social determinants of the violence. Um, and I'd like you again to turn to your partners, talk about it a little bit. Um, and then just what's come back from your discussions is that you feel that South Africa is a real center of male-on-male -male violence. You feel that in the countries that you're coming on, it, it, it does happen, particularly in the, in the context of alcohol and alcohol abuse, but that South Africa is, is a lot more. Um, and then the drivers of male violence, we're going to be looking at um, quite a bit more. So to move on, what you think are the social determinants of gender-based violence? Um, and here, you know, there, there, there are many things um, that, that come up. It could be concepts of masculinity, um, which is a key driver, where men have a concept of themselves being men that they've got to be in control and, gone, and, and should be powerful. And this comes into play with women. It comes into play sometimes with children. It also comes into play with other men where they're vying for power. So, you know, importantly there is to look at the damage that that form of masculinity, if it's dominant, has on both men and on women. Um, because it's not good for men either. It causes harm to women, which is not good for men, and it also causes harm to themselves. We must remember that most men don't engage in violence, gender-based violence or other forms of violence. So, you know, it is important that we look at the social determinants because if it was purely, if it was biological, if it was testosterone, then all men would be doing this. So I think it's important that we look at the, the, the social determinants. Other determinants include um, poverty, uh, people not having although gender-based violence happens in rich communities as well, but sometimes people feel there's no hope for the future, um, so they engage in, in a substance abuse, and that often goes along with gender-based violence. 
or they lack power in a certain situation economically, and so they come home and take out their power in that arena. So those are all possibilities, and I'd like you to think of more ways. But, you know, as I said, um, I think that the main core issue is concepts of masculinity, which cut, can cut across class. So it's not only in poor communities. And then another major determinant is alcohol. <coughs> so this is, again, from South Africa. And if we look at, um, for example, the frequency of taking four or five drinks on one occasion by sex, male or female, you'll see that it's high. Um, it's particularly high amongst men, but it's also quite high amongst um, women. So <coughs> this is percentages. High, uh, um, South Africa has the highest per capita alcohol consumption per drinker in the world. And what it's really, a, alcohol is really binge drinking in South Africa. So it's not that people drink all the time, but there are particular times when they drink a lot, and then they have particular risk in terms of, of engaging in violence. Um, and it's definitely associated with increased levels of, um, of sexual and domestic violence. <coughs> I just wondered what you know about the consequences of gender-based violence. Um, what consequences do you see at primary level, for example, uh, care, primary care level uh, for clients and providers? Um, so the consequences of gender-based violence, just your having fed back to me, is that it can be at a physical level. People can get um, physically hurt. They can become ra they can get raped, and that can cause um, long-term physical gynecological um, harm. Um, also, to men, it can cause long-term um, harm. For example, rape doesn't have to be a penis in a vagina. In South Africa, it's also de it's also defined as using any object to penetrate um, um, to penetrate a man or a woman. Um, so there are physical outcomes of harm. They're also psychological and emotional, which can be very long-standing. Um, so it can make a person feel that they're to blame. Uh, it can undermine their self-esteem. It can cause depression. It can cause anxiety. So there can be very long-term effects of um, experiences of violence. It can cause post-traumatic stress. And then, of course, in the case of sexual violence, it can also cause... Uh, sexually transmitted infection, including HIV. Uh, providers also can suffer from violence, both as in their own domestic situation. Um, they may be um, um, survivors themselves of domestic violence. And in health centres, sometimes particularly with gang violence, they can be the object of, um, of violence. That if they're trying to protect somebody who's come in who's been physically harmed, sometimes... Uh, members of the gang will go in to try and finish off a gang member who, who they've assaulted. And this is also dangerous for healthcare providers. Um, looking at interventions, because obviously, you know, in the public health field, what we want to do is try and see if we can deal with the consequences, but if we can, uh, to, 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 have, to, to have prevention and promotive activities apart from curative and um, rehabilitative activities, which you, we discussed earlier, are the kind of cornerstones of primary health care. Um, so there's the law and there's the legal system. Um, and then there are other interventions as well. So in terms of the law, um, South African laws are not terribly well implemented. So many people say that we've got some of the best laws and policies in the world, but they're like Porsches that have been parked in the garage. So, you know, I'm going through with you what is the law, but that doesn't mean that it's very well implemented. It's nevertheless important to have a law because it can be used. So our Criminal Offences Amendment Act, which came into effect in 2008, after a very long period of negotiation, um, makes it an offence... Um, to, to rape, and this includes its rape, sexual assault, display of sexual acts, um, um, genital, of genital organs and pornography, incest, 
bestiality. And the definition of rape is that it's any person who unlawfully and intentionally commits an act of sexual penetration with another person without such person's consent. So it doesn't have to be uh, a penis to a vagina. Sometimes people have used objects. Um, and it also can be anybody. So it does include marital rape, for example. Um, and I'd like you just to think about how this compares to where you come from. Is the definition in your, in your country as broad as this or in your context? Um, is marital rape included as part of, um, as part of a rape? Of part of rape, and I know that somebody a bit earlier said it's it's fairly simple that no should be no. Whenever a person says no or indicates no, then if you go against that, that actually does constitute um, coercion and therefore rape. There are also laws on domestic violence in South Africa. Um, so South Africa's constitution is based on principles of human dignity quality, human rights, and freedom. And so our Domestic Violence Act, which came into, into force a lot earlier than our amended uh, sec, uh, Sexual Violence Act, came into um, effect four years after democracy in 1998. It means that a person may seek a protection order from a magistrate um, against an abusive person who's commit, committing abuse or domestic violence. It could be physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, could be sexual abuse, could be economical abuse, like I described, intimidation, could be stalking, could be damaging the person's property. And, you know, again, it's a very good law. It is sometimes difficult to implement it. Very often, those that um, experience domestic violence are economically dependent on the person who perpetrates the violence. So they may Want, they may not be able to move out of the home. They may not be able to survive, and particularly with their children involved without them. And I know that Mosaic, that is an organization in Cape Town that's worked a lot with domestic uh, violence interdict, says that many of them are withdrawn after being, um, after being uh, put in place because the, the survivors can't, can't manage um, without the, the financial support of the, the perpetrator. Or sometimes the person thinks that he's going to change. So we may want to look at the individual level, for example, the micro level, individuals, peers, relationships, households. We may want to work at the community level, the social and cultural values and norms. Or we may want to work at the structural level, the political, economic, social, health, other institutional programs of services, or we may want to work in a way that's, that straddles all of these. Okay, so if we look at comprehensive approaches in addressing uh, gender-based violence, um, first of all, um, many organizations um, feel that there needs to be some sort of theory but you need to know what you're wanting to do to get effective change. But you need to look at level one, what are the risk factors driving the problem. You need to look at level two, what are we trying to change? For example, what are ideas of what it means to be a man or a woman? We may want to look, we need to look at level three. In fact, we do need to look at all three of these. Um, how do we want to address behavior change? What drives it? What enables it? And what are the best methods? Um, what are their strengths and limitations? So, in other words, we need to set out with a plan that looks at different levels of what we're wanting to do. And we need to also look at what does this mean for a primary health care approach? So, for example, um, you, earlier you looked at issues around prevention, promotion, uh, promotion being more in the, fil in the field of sort of education, uh, cure or treatment or care, and also rehab, rehabilitation. We looked at the fact that, for example, there's post-traumatic stress. So we need to look at all these levels when we're looking at how do we, what, what methods to achieve change, we might want to look at a number of different levels. 
Um, so this is just a table, and I'm not going to go through it in great, in great depth. But first of all, we need to ask a number of questions, um, like, for example, who are the change agents? In other words, who do we want to target who are going to help us to bring about change? What are our desired outcomes? Um, who, who are we going to make responsible for the social and health changes? Um, whose views need to be considered? So, you know, who do we need to take into account? How do we incorporate gender? And then we can, there's, there's several approaches. So there were some early approaches, promising approaches, and then approaches that are more integrated and are more, more gender uh, gender specific sort of approaches. So you can have a look through this in your own time and have a look. The early approaches tended to look at the individual as the agent of change. The promising approaches tended to look at the small group as the agent of change, shifting social norms and behavior. The strategic approaches recognized not that you don't need to work at these two levels, but to change something, you also need to change it at the, at the institutional level, at the structural level. Um, for example, some programs found that you can change things amongst individuals, but then they go back into their community or back into the soci society, and it's hard to sustain it. So that's how it came about that we started looking at different kinds of ways of dealing with the problem. So what we're going to do now, lastly, is I'm going to give you some community-based examples of gender-based violence interventions. And I'd like you in your groups to then look at what, what you think about these programs, what you think they're trying to achieve. Um, there's a little bit of data on, um, on what, what evaluations there have been and wh whether you, what you feel some of the limitations and the, the gains have been of these um, these different interventions, and then um, we'll discuss that. So what we'd like you to do is, first of all, as I said, your views on the interventions, whether there's an impact, uh, whether you think there's some weaknesses that need to be improved, whether it's relevant to your context, whether you feel you could use some of these examples, or what's already happening in your context, and what particularly can be used through a primary healthcare approach. So, thinking back to the issues of uh, promotive health, prevent preventive health, promotive health, care or cure, um, and then rehabilitation. So the first group looked at a program called Stepping Stones, which has operated in about 40 countries in the world. It was developed originally in Uganda, and it's been adapted uh, for use to diff 17 different settings. And there was a very interesting one that I gave you to have a look at from Malawi, where they made it much shorter than the original one. It was really aimed at being gender transformative. In other words, changing, um, trying to change some of the, the, the basic structural things. Um, it's aimed to improve sexual health through building stronger, more gender equitable relationships, and it was wanting to impact on gender-based violence and on HIV. So it was focusing on communication, on gender relations, HIV, community mobilization. And its theoretical approach was that it wanted to change gender power relations. The way it operated was through participatory learning. Peer groups were divided. It was mostly with young people but also with other groups, were divided into groups, um, single sex um, and age groups. And over three to four months, they went through a series of participatory learning sessions. Um, what they found, and it was evaluated in South Africa in 35 intervention and 35 control villages in the Eastern Cape, is they found there was a reduction in gender-based violence and greater harmony and mutual respect amongst um, in decision-making. They also found that relationships were enhanced, that those who'd undergone the course, that there was improved communication on sexual matters between male and female partners and with children. 
And they also found, uh, sorry, it was also in Durban, that um, there was improved, uh, less male participation in crime, for example, and other ways found of improving socioeconomic status. In HIV, they found that there was greater knowledge, um, but there was no reduction in HIV new cases, incidents. They found there was a reduction in the um, herpes simplex vir virus, vi virus, but not in HIV. Now, HIV, this might take quite a long time to have an impact, or it may just be that the program wasn't effective enough. The interesting thing they found is that um, in the short and medium term, there was a reduction in high sexual risk behaviors for men. For example, less transactional sex, less intimate partner violence, problem drinking, um, a decrease in multiple partners, increased condom use, but they didn't find it for women, only for men. And we don't know if this was going to be sustained for men. So it's interesting just in terms of thinking about did it really tackle the, stru the structures? What, what were the limitations? Did women find it difficult when they went back into the communities or because of social and political structures to change their behavior? So that's something to think about. This is an example of the Malawi program um, and it just shows that it's been adapted. The second program that you had a look at was Prevention in Action, which was a program that ran in South Africa again, in Kailicha, in Cape Town, and also in an urban area of KwaZulu-Natal. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to set up a model for social mobilization in the community, specifically to address violence against women. They partnered with other NGOs or community-based organizations. They train community engagers, um, about, 15, about 5 to 20, who then in turn um, trained about 20, to, about 20 community influencers. They got training, they got a toolkit, they got T-shirts, and their job was to go out into the community and to educate and to intervene where they saw community, uh, they saw gender-based violence happening. They also had a lot of media. Um, and as actions increased, as there were more actions where violence was stopped or brought to their attention, they established something called violence-free zones where houses in the community volunteered to put up a sign outside their house to say that they are a violence-free zone. And if violence was starting to happen, um, they could then be brought to that house and it could be talked through to see if it could be avoided. So it may be the people themselves, it may be neighbors who see what's happening and so on. So that was the plan. Interestingly, they started by wanting to change norms and ideas, but they found that people, when they did um, an assessment, they found that people didn't think it was okay to beat a woman. So then they realized that what they needed to do was to get a critical mass of people who could be mobilized and take action rather than just to change ideas. They did do uh, an evaluation and it was very quantitative. They found that 2,500 actions were taken aimed at either preventing, preventing it from occurring again or providing support. The most co common form of violence, and it and which is to be expected, was male to female intimate partner violence. Approaches to prevention that were most common were either police or legal involvement, uh, discussion with the victim and the perpetrator, discussion with the victim only, referral for counseling, discussion with the perpetrator only. So those were the most common. It was a little bit worrying that the most common is police or legal, which means that although there was a large amount of discussion with the victim and the perpetrator and other forms. It means it wasn't working altogether. But nevertheless, it was working to some extent. Um, and then just generally, they found there were improved relations. It broke a silence. The violent zones had a potentially sustainable uh, response at community level. 
And what is very interesting is they linked up with the Safer Cities local government elect, um, initiative so that it could be sustained beyond the project. The last one is the Image Programme, which was um, tried out in Limpopo in South Africa. Um, it was uh, Image st stood for Intervention for Microfinance and Gender Equality, and this is based on an idea that has happened elsewhere. For example, in India, there's the Grameen Bank Initiative, or in uh, Bangladesh, there's the Grameen Bank Initiative. In Uganda, there's something called SASA, which means now. And what it, what it aims to do is it's a structural intervention that is aimed at economic and gender inequalities, believing that if you can empower women economically, um, that you can reduce gender-based violence, violence against women, and HIV. It was evaluated in eight rural communities after two years, and it was found that there was a 55% reduction in intimate partner violence. There were high levels of communication between partners and among partners and also children. Um, that also women improved their financial contribution, and that led to less marital stress and more har harmonious household relationships. Although in some communities it's been found that if men are also not economically empowered, that can be a problem, that they then see themselves as humiliated and, not, and sort of undermined by women. So one needs to look at that as well. In the youngest group, the 40, sorry, the younger group, 14 to 35 years, there was increased participant use of HIV counselling, but there was no increase in HIV. It seems that HIV incidence is very hard to bring about. There was some indication of, 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 improve, of less risky sexual behaviour in the younger participants. So that is a good finding. Um, I'm not going to go through the One Man Can campaign, but just to say that this is a campaign that is run by Sonke Gender Justice, which is a, a group that works with men throughout the African continent, and they've decided to target men specifically. So seeing men as the most often the perpetrators of violence, what they, aimed at, what they aim at is gender transformation in how men see themselves as men. They do involve women, but it's primarily de working with men. So again, we need to look at, is that the right thing to do? To what extent should one be invo involving women as well? And so on. There are a number of other um, uh, initiatives. You've mentioned some. You've mentioned some in Zimbabwe. I think all of you knew about Padare. You mentioned another number of other initiatives in the countries that you come from. There are also some elsewhere in the world. For example, Repro Salud in Bolivia and Peru. Uh, there's Inner Spaces, Outer Faces, which operates in India. All these are gender transformation, trying to address the social determinants of gender-based violence. And there are a number of other examples, particularly of emerging approaches of working with men. Uh, group education media-type programs, community radio-type programs like photo voice, digital storytelling, advocacy. Um, we need to think of what can have a sustainable and long-lasting sort of impact. And most importantly, we need to think of what works, what's been evaluated, um, what has had an effect. And then lastly, there's also health service interventions, detecting and supporting, detecting intimate partner violence, supporting it, screening for it, comprehensive post-rape care, counselling, uh, post-exposure uh, prophylaxis, emergency contraception, for example. Um, so there are a number of health service interventions that are also important. So if we look at the spectrum of change, there are a number of areas that we can work in. Um, there's, working, there's working with government to influence policy and uh, legislation. There's at a community level, um, mobilization and advocacy. 
There are networks where we try and uh, foster coalitions. There's changing and strengthening organizational policy practices within an organization. There's educating providers and key stakeholders. There's community education. And then there's also at the individual level, um, strengthening individual knowledge and skilled leadership and capacity. And if we're wanting to effect change and influence the social determinants, work at all these levels is valuable. So that's the last one, and then it's open to questions and discussion. Um, and then just in summary, um, there's evidence that well-designed well gender transformative group interventions can change gender-based violence-related attitudes and practices. We saw examples of stepping stones, one man can, padare, etc. Also, um, strategies that increase women's economic participation and success, um, that influence communication programs, um, that challenges obviously exist in working in a sustainable way and scaling up initiatives. I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges. But we need good policies and legislation. But although they're important, we need linkages. We need to monitor their implementation. Um, and also, we need international donors and other donors who fund is sustained ongoing rigorous research, as well as training and resources to monitor the government implementation of gender-based violence. So, in conclusion, there's no magic bullet solution that works in every context. What has proven to be successful in one setting um, really should be used as a learning resource and an inspiration rather than a simple model to be transplanted. You can't just use it as it is. You need to look at the local context and inform um, your um, initiative to see what needs to be done in your environment and what you can use and what you can't use. So that's in conclusion um, where I'm going to stop. Mm -hmm.